All right. All right. All right. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker today. And our colloquium speaker is our own Katrina Shadzinyo. Uh, she's a new physics faculty member at Caltech. And many of you have only met her virtually, but I've had the privilege of meeting her in person because she's brave enough to give her colloquium from Hamitman Auditorium in Cahill, except she didn't know where Hamitman was today, but that's okay, we learn as we go. <laughs> okay, more seriously, Katrina got her bachelor's degree from the University of Athens in Greece and her PhD from Montana State University. Um, after that, she did a couple of postdocs at uh, CETA, um, one fellowship there, and then another fellowship at the Flat Iron Institute of the Simons Foundation. Um, and then she's come here to join us at Caltech. Um, Katrina recent, has won many prizes, including a thesis prize just last year called the Jurgen Ehlers Thesis Prize awarded by the International Society on General Relativity and Gravitation. And I know her colloquium is gonna be super fun because if you look her up on ADS, it's a spectacular record with over hundred publications, only half of which are with the LIGO Virgo collaboration. Um, so that's pretty cool. And uh, a whopping H index, and you can go and lo log in and see for yourself what that is. And with that, uh, Katrina, please take it away. Okay, I'm going to turn on my speakers and the mic, and I think it should all be working. And if it's not working, please let Nancy know, and she will let me know. Okay, thanks everyone for joining, and many special thanks to Nancy for uh, persisting through this and getting everything ready, and Chris for helping us, and Judy for being here and making this not a one-on-one -on -one lecture on Nancy. Okay, so as probably is probably the case for most of you, this is my first in-person talk in uh, a year and a half. So we're about to find out if in-person talks are like uh, learning a new language or are they like learning how to bike in that do you actually forget how to do it without practice? <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so I joined Caltech uh, last September about nine months ago uh, a lot has happened in the meantime. What has not happened is uh, uh, having had the chance to, to meet basically any of you. Uh, so what I mostly work on is gravitational waves and gravitational wave astrophysics and general relativity. And as you probably uh, know, Katrina, you muted yourself. Okay. Better? I was trying to figure out how to advance my slides. Okay. So as you probably know, in the last uh, about, I, I started working on gravitational waves general relativity about 10, 12 years ago as an undergrad. And as you probably know, progress in the field in the meantime has been sort of exponential uh, in the colloquial sense of the word, not the technical sense of the word. With the first detection of gravitational waves, and a grand total of uh, dozens of detections in the meantime, most of our detections come in the form of uh, black holes. By far, we actually did not know this would happen before we started seeing detections, but by far the most, uh, by far the most abundant source of gravitational waves we see are black holes, but we also see lots of neutron stars as well. So this uh, huge population of black holes, literally dozens of black hole binaries today, come with a lot of uh, interesting questions and you can have many talks about the properties of black holes uh, and uh, everything you want to know about them. I'll be happy to talk about it. But there are so many interesting topics you can talk about with gravitational waves. So you have to down select. And what I will talk about today is a couple of topics that are closer to, to my heart in some sense. So we'll talk about mostly, the, the majority of the talk will be about neutron stars and time permitting towards the end. I will talk a little bit about uh, testing general relativity if we have the time, which is a bit of a, sometimes I think of it a bit of it as, a, as a guilty pleasure um, study field for me. Okay, so neutron stars, before the detection of gravitational waves, the first detection in 2015, uh, actually we, we weren't sure whether black holes and neutron stars would be mostly detected with ground-based detectors. 
Uh, in, in, in practice, we know that there are a lot more neutron stars in the universe than black holes, but we're a lot more sensitive to black holes. So, because they're more massive, so we didn't actually know it's gonna happen. In, in reality, of course, we found out that we are more sensitive to black holes by a lot. So we see uh, most black holes. But uh, we're also seeing a lot of neutron stars and neutron stars are basically gonna be the protagonists of the story today. Neutron stars are, are exceptional uh, objects. They are the most compact object that we know of, the most compact material object. Anything, anything more compact, anything more dense than a neutron star is really doomed to collapse into a black hole. So they're literally the last, last winning battle of, of matter against total, total gravitational collapse. And because the conditions are so extreme inside, inside neutron stars, they're the most extreme condition of matter we can, we can, can see, we're actually not sure what is going on in their interiors from, from their, their properties of the interior inside, inside neutron stars to just basically the, the bare composition of neutron stars. What, what forms of matter encounter in neutron stars are all questions we don't know the answer to. So in, in this uh, landscape, nuclear physics has spent decades trying to construct nuclear models for what happens inside neutron stars. And those models are called equations of state. You see a number of examples on the left plot here that show the pressure as a function of density inside neutron star, the typical densities you can see on the x-axis. We're talking about femtometers cubed. So basically densities uh, larger than the saturation density, the density of, of normal normal nuclei. And we actually uh, believe because neutron stars are, neutron star matter is expected to be in its ground state, we actually believe that these equation of state is unique. So if one neutron star has an equation of state and all other neutron stars in the universe have the same equation of state. The interesting thing uh, when you are considering astronomy now is that all these nuclear models that nuclear physicists have constructed can be translated into macroscopic properties four neutron stars on the right side. So on the right side, there's a plot of the mass and the radius inside neutron stars. And each line on the left plot is in a one-to-one -one correspondence with a line on the, on the right plot through the general divistic structure equations. So this is what astronomers are trying, are using in order to study neutron stars. We're trying to figure out what masses and radii they have. And you can see from the models here, the various models, um, that, that describe mass and radius of neutron star, you have a quite a large variation. We're talking about models that predict masses, very low masses, 10 kilometers, going up to 15 kilometers. That's a 50% variation in the sizes of neutron stars. And when you're talking about astronomy, a 50% variation doesn't sound too big. But when you're actually considering astronomical phenomena involving neutron star, this 50% variation is actually large. So it does influence what we actually expect to observe from neutron stars, which is of course good news because then we can use those observations to, to, to go back and, and measure the size of neutron stars in the equation of state. So this is a general story. And then enter gravitational waves, of course, and most of the detections I've been saying are black holes and the, the, the signals that we are observing from various black hole binaries look something like that. Uh, plotted here, you see the characteristic increasing amplitude, the characteristic increasing frequency. Compared to this, the signal we get from two neutron stars merging looks like this. It's going to take a while. We actually observed GW 170817 for about two minutes. I'm not going to play the whole thing, obviously. But the, the, the main thing you notice when you see a signal from two neutron stars merging gravitational waves is how long it takes. When you see a signal that's no longer seconds, no longer dozens of milliseconds, then you immediately know that the binary components are low. The masses are low and most likely uh, related to neutron stars. The second uh, telltale sign of neutron stars is what actually happens when they get very close together. Uh, neutron stars are not big. They're about 10 kilometers in, in, in radius, 20 kilometers in diameter, but still that's, that's 20 kilometers. That's, that's not negligible. So when the neutron stars get very close together, they're going to start tidal interacting with each other, same way the Earth and uh, the, the, the moon tidal interact with each other. So here's a numerical simulation of two neutron stars merging, the very late stages. You can see the gravitational wave signal at the bottom. And the neutron stars are kind of close together at this stage. Uh, they're orbiting around each other, losing energy to the gravitational radiation. And eventually they get so close together that they are tidally ripping each other apart, colliding here, matter is ejected all over the place. It's a, it's a complete mess. 
that is very different than the almost peaceful merger of two black holes where they come together, join their horizons, and they happening inside that. So if you go back to the detections that we have, when you're talking about neutron stars, you're talking the lowest masses possible uh, that you have you have detected. And in the low mass regime, when you're thinking around one, two, three solar masses, the main thing, the main divider, um, the main the main divider between uh, what happens in the low and what happens in the high masses is this line here. This line at 3.2 solar masses is where we believe to be the absolute maximum uh, neutron star mass. This comes from causality considerations. If you consider uh, new, neutron star equation states that are uh, maximally causal, which means that the speed of sound is equal to the speed of light, it, it can be any, any larger than that, then the maximum neutron star mass you can have is about 3.2 solar masses. So anything above 3.2 solar masses, there's no doubt what's going on. That's a black hole. This is not what this talk is about. But what is below 3.2 solar masses, this is where the, the excitement is when you are interested in neutron stars. And there's a number of objects detected down there below 3. about 3.2 solar masses. Okay, so let's talk then a little bit more about neutron stars and how we detect them with gravitational waves. So this plot here shows you basically everything you need to know about gravitational waves and from, from, uh, from, from neutron star binaries. Uh, this, this plot shows you amplitude on the y-axis as a function of frequency, so you're in the frequency domain. And you've probably seen the U-shaped lines before, the blue and the gray lines like that denote the sensitivity of gravitational wave detectors. That's what we use to denote the sensitivity. So the further down those lines are, the better. Blue is the sensitivity back in 2017 when we detected GW 170017 Gray is uh, at least what back then was a design sensitivity. It's probably been, been a bit revised today and we don't think we're gonna reach the low frequency uh, sensitivity in this plot, but this is, this is the, just conveys a general idea that the sensitivity will improve. And the decreasing lines of various colors are the gravitational wave signal. And there, there are different colors there. And the different colors basically correspond to different equations of state. So you have two neutron stars with the same masses, same parameters, but just different equation states merging. The early stage at low frequencies is called the in spiral. This is where the neutron stars are really far apart from each other. And because they're so far apart, they might as well be orbiting around the black hole. They don't know they're orbiting around the neutron star. There is no effect of the equation of state unless you consider uh, weird resonances and stuff. But for the most part, during the long end spiral, there's no effect of the equation of state. Eventually, you have the latent spiral where the two neutron stars get close together and they start tidally distorting each other. And that's where the excitement begins because now you see that the different lines have different predictions for the signal, which means a signature for the equation of state. And eventually there's no turning back, of course, the neutron stars will collide, will merge uh, in what we call the post-merger that will form a remnant star, which will keep emitting gravitational waves. So let's talk a little bit about what we can learn from these different uh, phases. Let's start with the spiral. This is what the gravitational wave signal at, uh, of a neutron star binary, actually two neutron star uh, binaries looks like in the spiral. One is the blue, the other is the orange. And I've plotted them here just to see different morphologies. But this, this just immediately shows you why we kind of never plot those things. These are so long that you don't even see oscillation. It looks like a, like a blob. But what happens is if you start observing such a signal from 10 hertz, which is the, the, the uh, design sensitivity, the nominal low frequency design sensitivity, uh, design sensitivity you start observing those two neutron stars where they're about four kilometers apart. And over the next 10,000 cycles and 10 minutes, they come together uh, to, to a merger. In reality, those numbers are probably a bit on the high side from what we expect will be achieved at science sensitivity, but it, it gives you the idea of what, what we're talking about. And in this phase, like I said a number of times, the two neutron stars behave like point particles. They might as well be two black holes. We don't really know anything about their internal structure from the signal. But that doesn't mean that this signal is not interesting. It's actually very interesting because that's where we get most of the information about things like masses and spins for the neutron stars. The plot here 
shows you the masses, M1 and M2, the masses of the two binary components for GW170817 in blue and in red, uh, analyzed with two different assumptions for the spins of the neutron stars. The spin is kind of a recurring theme. It comes in and affects a lot of uh, things. So assumptions you make about the spin are actually quite influential in your, in your conclusions. Uh, but for, for those of you who are not as familiar with relativistic spin units and prefer period, uh, spin periods, there's uh, the formula at the top gives you the conversion. So one millisecond pulsar has a spin of 0.4 in relativistic units. Uh, but this, this is basically what we measure. This is a very typical mass measurement from a neutral star binary. We measure uh, a combination of the masses called the chirp mass extremely well. That's why this two-dimensional line is basically a, almost like a single line, not a, not a region. We don't measure the mass ratio very well, uh, and everything is related to the spins. This is a complication we always have to deal with. Everything seems to be uh, more or less related to how, how we deal with the spins. But overall, this is what we measure for GW170817. And GW170817 was basically the, the, the poster child. It, it looks perfect. Mass is exactly what we expected from neutron stars and what we expected from neutron stars in binaries, everything, everything is perfect. Mass around 1.3, 1.4 solar masses. Okay, eventually the two neutron stars will get really close together and we start tidal interacting. And this is where the fun begins if you're interested in learning something about the equation of state of neutron stars. So to understand why, I'm gonna show you two uh, uh, simulations. So these are results from numerical activity simulations that show the merger of two neutron stars. So the four neutron stars in here on the left and on the right are basically constructed to be as identical as possible. They have the same masses, they were put on the same uh, location, given the same velocity, press go. The main difference, well, the only difference is the equation of state of the two uh, neutron stars on the left and the right. And you immediately see the difference. The ones on the left are bigger, the ones on the right are smaller. And when we start the evolution, what happens is that the ones on the left, the big ones, evolve faster. So they seem to be rotating around each other a little bit uh, quicker, they're accelerating more, they're already merging now. Well, the ones on the right are still happily orbiting around each other that look like nice little spheres. Eventually, they're not going to avoid the collision. Uh, they will also be distorted and merged. This is happening right now. But the general thing to keep in mind is that the bigger the neutron star, the faster this whole evolution proceeds. Mathematically, if you want to think about it, is the standard theory of tidal interactions. If you have a spherical object, you put in an external field, it will grow a quadruple moment like any other, any other uh, finite size object. In a binary, this happens twice because you have two objects, you have two neutron stars. And also the companion is what is providing the, the tidal field, the distorting field. So if you have a binary, one object creates a tidal field and the other object responds and uh, grows a quadruple moment, essentially. And that constant of proportionality is uh, the main quantity. If you're, if you're considering, if you're listening about gravitational waves and neutron stars and equation of state, what you will definitely listen about is this quantity called the tidal deformability. What this does is it's, it's basically defined from this equation. And it, did, it tells you how easy or how difficult it is to deform a star. If this quantity is large, then the star is easy to deform. If the quantity is small, then the star is more difficult to deform. And that basically is what, what we measure. This directly influences the in spiral because if it's more deformable, Remember, it, the evolution proceeds faster. And that also depends on the equation of state because if it's more deformable, it means the star is bigger. So the radius is, is larger, which is a consequence of the equation of state. In reality, we measure a complicated combination, of course. It doesn't matter what the details are, uh, but in, just the thing to keep in mind is that you have two neutron stars, two tidal parameters. We actually measure one combination of those because uh, it's, it's, it's much more difficult to measure two combinations. So to measure uh, both of them independently. But the plots here show you exactly what the signal looks like. In the top, you have the signal in the time domain. And in the bottom, you have the signal in the frequency domain, where, again, you have two neutron stars, exact same parameters. The only thing that differs is the equation of state. So the only thing that differs is how large this tidal parameter is. And if you perhaps it might be easier to focus on the, top, on the, on the, on the bottom panel, uh, and you see uh, two, three different values actually for this tidal parameter. At, at zero, this, you have the green signal. This is what we uh, 
expect slash believe slash assume black holes will look like. We sort of think that black holes have a zero tidal parameter. There's a little bit of a debate about this, but it's probably that they have a zero tidal parameter, at the very least completely ignorable. Uh, and as you increase this tidal parameter, you go from the green to the pink to the blue. So if you follow with your eyes the peaks of the waveform, you'll see that you basically go in the waveform, you go from the blue to the pink to the green. So the larger this, uh, this tidal deformation is, the fastest the evolution proceeds. Uh, the complication, of course, is that actually, if you notice the x-axis of those plots, this is not something that is a very prominent effect in, in the waveform, especially if you look at the top. We're talking about 100 milliseconds there. You have a signal that lasts for 10 minutes, 2 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes. The, the action, when it comes to equation of state, happens at the very late stages. Forget about all the 10,000 cycles I was discussing earlier. If you're interested in tidal deformation, you're looking at the few dozens of cycles at the end. OK. But that doesn't mean we're not going to try to measure this, obviously. So the, here's the result for GW170817. Uh, the, the plot on the right gives you the results of the analysis for the tidal parameters of the two neutron stars, because you have a binary, you have two of those parameters. Different colors give you slightly different analysis with different assumptions. I'm not going to go into details. But everything and everyone agrees with the general picture that GW170817 points to the small side for tidal effects. So everything is concentrated on the, on the low side, the bottom left uh, part of this plot, so, which means smaller tidal parameters, which means less deformable stars, which means more compact stars. If something is very compact, it's harder to deform it, so the parameters are smaller. So GW170817 rules out the less compact neutron stars, the larger radii uh, for neutron stars. And then after GW170817 came GW190425, about two years later. And this is more peculiar. Uh, this plot here shows you the total mass. So you have a binary, you have the, you sum the two masses, you get a total mass. And it shows you here you have the total mass of various neutral star binaries. In the, the dashed line shows you galactic neutral star binaries. You have 20 odd such systems in the galaxy. And their total mass, the sum of their two masses, is around 2.7 solar masses. 170817 fell squarely in this regime. It was perfectly consistent with this picture. This new guy here does not agree with this picture. It has a total mass of about 3.3 solar masses, let's say. The individual components by themselves are perfectly consistent with neutron stars. They have masses around 1.8, 1.7 solar masses. And we have, of course, seen many, many neutron stars as, as heavy as that, even above two solar masses. But all those neutron stars were never in a binary around another neutron star. They are uh, in binaries around um, white dwarfs. But, but GW190425 is, is the first example, we think, uh, of uh, a, a compact binary where both objects are actually on the fairly heavy side. And that is uh, both good and bad news. The good news is that now we know those binaries exist. We, we actually, before GW 19 or 425, we never, we didn't know that there would be, that even such compact, massive compact binaries would exist in the universe. Now we know they do. But the problem is that if you want to measure tidal parameters from, from such a system, that's actually really hard to do. The reason is, remember I said, uh, uh, tidal effects uh, depend a lot on how compact the star is. And if a star is very compact, which means it's, it's massive, it's higher, it's more compact, it's actually harder to deform. This statement has absolutely nothing to do with what the equation of state of neutron stars is. It's just an inherent fact. If something is compact, you cannot deform it, no matter what the equation of state is. So we couldn't measure any tidal effects, and we couldn't measure it not even in the interesting way of you put upper limits, but in, in, the, more, in the less interesting way of the upper limit would put is higher than what we think is the physically interesting region where we expected this to be. So it was just not constraining at all. And this will be a trend moving forward. Those heavy systems are gonna be a challenge to, to understand with gravitational waves. Okay, so before I put everything together and tell you what we have uh, about the equation of state, I, I want to take a 
very tiny one slide detour because I'm going to start talking about X-ray observations that also constrain the radius. So I just wanted to give you a one slide um, explanation of what I mean by, by X-ray observations. So uh, a, a very nice probe of the equation of state uh, structure has emerged in the uh, last year through X-ray observations with NICER that basically tracks hotspots on the surface of either isolated neutron stars or even neutron stars and binaries. In fact, uh, about a year, year and a half ago, they were able to measure the mass of an isolated neutron star based on, on this technique. So what you have, what you have, you have a hotspot, you see animation there, as it goes around, you actually uh, get, get a pulsation from, from the, the surface emission. For a, an example, is, is shown on the plot on, on the right of such a pulsation. So a few years ago, they uh, an uh, analyzed the data and announced a mass radius measurement from pulsar J0030 on the bottom, which gives you the, the measurement for the mass and the radius. Uh, the, you should be, able to, uh, should be able to see the radius at the, at the bottom. Okay, good, because people in here can't see the radius, it's cut off. Okay. Uh, the general idea, at least at least for J0030, how, how this measurement goes, is that if the star is very compact, that means that the, the light emitted from the spot is bent. So you actually see the spot even when it's in the back. So for how long you see the spot as it goes around basically tells you about how compact the, the neutron star is. And also you can get uh, other edge effects that can constrain the radius and break the degeneracy between the mass and, 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 and the radius. And this general picture is, is uh, this picture actually is not general. This is more or less applies to J0030, but this is not what will happen for all other neutron stars. So how exactly you measure the compactness and the radius and how important edge effects are, uh, will depend on the spin of the pulsar or kind of the size of the hotspot, but so take, take this with, uh, with a, a bit of um, a grain of salt. But if you put everything together, then here's, here's what uh, the equation state uh, landscape looks like more or less these days. So here's a plot a measurement for the uh, mass radius for neutron stars, the mass radius relation, including different data sets. And if you start with a prior for your analysis, which is the two black lines, then you start adding data one at a time. And the first data set you add, of course, is the knowledge that we have seen heavy pulses. We've seen neutron stars with masses around two solar mass and perhaps above. And that puts a lower limit and pushes everything to larger pressures, larger radii. Gravitational waves have the opposite effect. Remember I said we did not detect tidal effects. We put upper limits on them and we constrained the neutron stars to not be very big. So that pushes everything down from the, from the opposite direction. And nicer, the X-ray data push you again in the opposite direction and you go from the green to the blue. And that is sort of the ideal scenario, right? When you have constraints that push you from different directions, that's where you get the best constraint. And that is sort of what the picture will look like in the next years as you get more gravitational wave data and more X-ray data that will be pushing you from different, different directions. The other interesting thing that seems to be, uh, we seem to have inferred about the equation of state is that actually uh, inside neutron stars, the speed of sound seems to be getting quite large. We think that uh, if you, if you in, the, in the very large density regime, uh, 40 times the nuclear saturation density, way above what neutron stars have, if you have three quarks, what, what the speed of sound is expected to be, is, is expected to approach about the value of a third. This is the telltale sign of weakly interacting particles. And that does not seem to be the case inside neutron stars. Inside neutron stars, if you measure the speed of sound, well, if you constrain the speed of sound with, with the observation, it seems to go above a third at some point inside, inside neutron stars, signaling the presence of, of, of strong, strong interactions. That is not to say that uh, we can constrain exactly what the composition is with these strong interactions, but it is a hint for, for nuclear physicists as they construct nuclear physics models. And another probe that we sometimes consider when it comes to understanding neutron star matters, of course, uh, terrestrial experiments, nuclear, phys nuclear physics experiments in, in, in labs on Earth. The problem there is that they actually probe slightly lower densities than what we are uh, interested in in neutron stars. And I'm gonna go into details about what this plot is. 
but it basically connects uh, elaborate a quantity that you measure in a lab with a quantity that uh, relates to neutron star matter. And just from this plot, you can see that when you relate the two, you do so at densities around the saturation, the nuclear saturation density, or slightly below the nuclear saturation density. Well, what is relevant for neutron stars is a little bit higher than that. It's uh, a few times the nuclear saturation density. That doesn't mean we're not gonna try to use that data, but it's not as, as straightforward. And finally, the, the last thing I wanted to, to bring up is something that I think uh, a lot of you here have spent time thinking about and definitely trying to collect the data, the actual data set, uh, which is also the, the electromagnetic counterpart, GW170817. There's a lot of um, discussion and debate about how to actually interpret it and what, uh, what uh, quantitative constraints it can place in the equation state. But the general idea is that in order to get the electromagnetic signal, you need some ejecta. In order to get some ejecta, you need the merger to not have immediately collapsed into a black hole. And in order to do that, you need the tidal parameters not be too small, which again is the opposite regime from where gravitational waves take you. So gravitational waves, remember, push you down. The requirement for an electromagnetic signal pushes you up, which is again, the, the best kind of situation to be in, but with a lot more interpretation uncertainties. Okay, before moving on and talking about the last stage of uh, neutron star coalescences, I wanted to briefly mention one more system that we have detected with gravitational waves, uh, GW190814. GW190814 is not a binary neutron star. GW190814 probably barely contains a neutron star, uh, but it has a a uh, surprising object. So the primary, it, the primary component in the binary has a mass of about two point, uh, 23 solar masses. That's a black hole, no questions asked. But the secondary has a mass of 2.6 solar masses. And that is getting to the regime where we don't know. Remember, if it's above 3.2, it's definitely a black hole. But we don't really know where neutron stars stop below 3.2. We don't really know where a 2.6 solar mass object could be a neutron star or not. The gravitational wave signal will never tell you the answer to this question. The, a 2.6 solar mass object is so heavy, so compact, if it is deformed, it's deformed in a by a tiny amount. So you will never measure that with a gravitational wave signal. So you actually need some sort of external information to, to learn about this. Uh, in this plot here, this external information comes in the form of the orange and green distributions that basically tell you what we think the maximum mass of neutron stars is. And the maximum mass comes from different sources of, in, of information and with their own interpretation issues. But 2.6 solar masses is on the high side of where we expect neutron stars to possibly be. So uh, I would say the majority of people, if you ask them, are gonna say this is a black hole, the lowest mass black hole ever observed. Uh, but uh, uh, using the equation of state information we have is what allows us to say, for example, that it is hard to accommodate a 2.6 solar mass neutron star. It is very hard. And we do that uh, again by going back to what we know about the equation of state. This is another view of our constraints in the equation of state, in this case, in terms of the pressure and the density inside the neutron stars. And you see the sort of the same picture I had before where heavy pulsars push the pressure up because the pressure needs to be high to support two solar mass objects. Gravitational waves push the pressure down because we do not detect large tidal interactions. X-rays again push the pressure up. But the problem is that I, I see, if, you, if you see the, the progression of the curves, all those different probes, all those different data sets operate at very different uh, densities, very different density regimes. So when you're talking about how big neutron stars can be, what we care about, what you care about is what happens at the highest densities, what happens at the centers of stars. Mass is mostly in a star, mass is mostly concentrated at the center. So it's the conditions at the center that dictate what happens with the mass. The radius of a star and the tidal parameters of a star mostly care about what happens in the outer layers because that's where volume is, that's where, that's where radius comes from. And this is where uh, you actually get information gravitational waves uh, and, and X-rays or radiant measurements. Uh, just 
for, for reference, though it's actually not included here, if you, if you actually want to overplot the nuclear experiment, it's actually even lower, but slight asterisk, asterisk that I actually I'm not including the nuclear experiment in, in this plot. And when you do that, this is where things start getting pretty complicated when you are trying to combine information from very different density regimes. And then you start getting into the weeds of how you actually do the analysis and what kind of models you assume for the equation of state and different models for the equation of state, common models that people use to, to relate, to, to, to join all the data sets that uh, predict different things for what happens at, la at low and high densities. So there's a lot of complication here. So here, this is um, from a study led by Caltech physics trust student, Isaac Legret, where he's looking at different models for the equation of state that people use during the analysis of data, try to understand what, what, they, what they impose on you in terms of what happens at low and what happens at high densities. Because if you wanna use a radius measurement to understand what the maximum mass of neutron stars is, that you need to do very carefully because you have information from low densities and you're trying to extrapolate to high densities. The last thing I wanted to say about this here is that uh, some of you might have heard that NICER announced the measurement of the radius of J0740, I think on Monday, which is the heaviest pulsar known to uh, today. It has a mass uh, about two solar masses, uh, slightly above two solar masses. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because it was only announced two days ago and we haven't had too much time to think about this. But again, this is a plot made by Isaac, where he was looking at what this means for uh, the equation of state constraints. And despite the fact that you're literally talking about the heaviest pulsar uh, we know of with uh, confirmed mass estimate, still the radius, when you measure the size of the pulsar, where you actually get information about what happens at the outer layer. So again, you're not really probing what happens at five and six times the saturation density, you're mostly probably what happens at two to three times saturation density. And you see here the curves going from the green to the blue show you the effect of the new constraint on the equation of state uh, as computed by Isaac literally yesterday. Okay, uh, that's all I want to say about tidal deformability and neutral science piles. But I also want to talk a little bit about the post-merger because once the neutron stars get close together, there's really no turning back. They're going to collide and they're going to merge. And this phase keeps emitting gravitational waves. The frequency, the, the sensitivity detector actually deteriorates at high frequencies. So the signal is harder to detect. But it's also very exciting because if you see the, the different colors for the signal, there's a huge variation depending on the equation of state. So if you actually see this, there's a lot of information about, about the equation of state here. So roughly speaking, when uh, two neutron stars merge, there are three possibilities. Either the system directly collapses into a black hole. And in this case, you have a final black hole, same way you have a final black hole from a binary black hole merger, and that black hole emits gravitational waves winding down. And that's sort of game over for us because that uh, signal comes at about 6,000 Hertz, which is absolutely impossible to detect. Fairly low amplitude, extremely high frequencies, it's, it's game over. On the extreme side, you have on the right side, you have long duration signals in, in which, which are caused by surviving neutron stars. If the remnant survives as a neutron star for a long time, whether that's uh, minutes, hours, indefinitely, you have a long duration signal. But in between those two extremes, you have this sort of metastable situation. We, it, you initially get a neutron star that survives for a little bit until it collapses into a black hole. And that a little bit means dozens of milliseconds. And the signal it emits, the gravitational wave signal, comes at a few thousand hertz, two to three, four thousand hertz. It's, it's high, it's higher than we would have liked, obviously. If it was lower, it would have been better, but we can work with two and three thousand hertz. Uh, in, in, in this case, the signal looks something like this. This is from a numerical activity simulation because you cannot really understand such deformed objects analytically. But you can see an example signal. It has short duration, high frequency. The, the really exciting thing about this, though, is if you actually project it to the frequency domain, if you like tilt your head a little bit and look at the signal uh, in the frequency domain, 
you will see that most of the emission uh, in this case comes at one single frequency component, has a very characteristic uh, peak in the frequency domain. And you can sort of see this if I pull back my simulations from earlier of the small neutron stars on the left, the big neutron stars on the right, you see that the small neutron stars merge with higher velocities, form higher densities and sort of oscillate more, more rapidly than the ones on, on the right. So the frequency will be higher for the ones on the left than the ones on the right. So exactly what that frequency is uh, also depends on the equation of state. So that is great. You have a single frequency to measure and it tells you a lot about the equation of state, but it's really hard to measure it. So for GW170817, this was not detectable. We did not detect it, but it was actually not detectable. So if you look at what you expect signals to look like uh, in the future, what if, sorry, if there was a signal, what it would have looked like, uh, this, these are the, co the various colored lines plotted here. And our upper limit is in blue. Our upper limit was again, not competitive with what the signal should have been. So we didn't expect to detect it. But we can do that in the future, uh, eventually. Um, uh, with, with increasing sensitivity in the detectors, if we um, get uh, better detectors as are currently uh, being uh, upgraded and actively uh, pursued, then we can get, we can um, detect the signal. So this animation shows you what happens as the detector uh, gets better. So the detector noise is depicted by the dashed line. So you see that it goes down. That means the detector is getting better. And the analysis, which is the shaded region actually recovers the signal and recovers the frequency. So we need something two to three times better than the design sensitivity of LIGO. And I realize uh, that something better than the design sensitivity sounds scary, but this is, it shouldn't be so, so, so scary because such improvements are actually under, under construction. Okay, right, I'm gonna skip this because I want to talk a little bit about uh, testing general relativity. So if you, uh, uh, for just the remaining how much time, I have about seven minutes. I want to talk a little bit, a little bit about one more thing because uh, I spent a lot of time talking about, about uh, neutron stars and working in neutron stars, but in reality, I feel in preparation, at least in preparation towards the fourth observing round of gravitational wave detectors, I spend probably most of my time on, on things like that and actual um, analysis. So I want to talk a little bit about, about this because I think one of the things I'm gonna mention could be of interest to, to some of you doing observations uh, of uh, gravitational wave signals. Okay, so the thing, the main thing I, I spend a lot of my time on is something called generic analysis. So here is, Again, a post-merger signal is, is very pretty. Again, this is simulated data, not real data. Don't think we actually observe this. And shows you the signal in the time domain. Black is a simulated signal, and it looks like a mess. It doesn't look like the nice gravitational wave we are used to. So when you're thinking about binary black holes, they look like this. They look so pretty. Uh, this is a lot more messy, which is good. It contains a lot of information, but it also means it's hard to analyze. Uh, and what we do in this case is something we call generic analysis, where we don't know that we have a binary black hole, but we're just looking for any kind of signal with very generic morphology. This is very flexible, but of course, because it's very flexible, it's also much harder to do. Again, I'm not going to go into details of how this happens. I would love to talk about it if you're interested. I just want to flash one slide with half a dozen, more than half a dozen possible um, applications for something such generic from supernova signals to post-merger to and anything in between. And for the last five minutes, I would like to talk about something that is a bit of a guilty pleasure research topic for me, which is testing general relativity. I really enjoy working on testing general relativity, not necessarily because I believe that it's likely that we will detect a deviation from GR with gravitational waves. But because at least in my personal uh, opinion and how I operate, uh, thinking about testing general relativity and thinking about ways GR breaks is, is in my opinion, the best way to actually understand the theory and also appreciate how, how simple it is in, in cases compared to its alternatives. So I'm gonna talk about one example of tests of general relativity and this sort of generic analysis I talked about 
are really are really well suited for testing general relativity because when you uh, break GR, when you break general relativity, you don't really know what kind of signals to expect anymore. And the thing that I will talk about is gravitational wave polarizations. Uh, gravitational waves in general relativity have two polarization states, famously called plus and cross, because of how they deform a ring of particles. So the plot on the left shows you how a ring of particles changes if the gravitational wave is propagating in or, or out of, of your, your screen, I guess. And depending on whether you have plus and cross polarizations, the detectors respond in different ways. The, one, the plot on the right shows you the response to uh, a, an L-shaped interferometric detector where the angles are 90 degrees, the, sorry, the two arms form a 90 degree angle and how the detector responds to two different polarization states. And the main thing I want to get across is when you're looking at gravitational wave polarizations and try to measure them, this is very similar to when you're trying to localize a, sky, a, a source in the sky because the polarization, the defining characteristic of gravitational wave polarization when it comes to measurement is how the detectors respond to them, the different response compared to where the signal is coming from in the sky. So if you want to measure the polarization content of a gravitational wave signal, you need at least two detectors. Makes sense, two degrees of freedom, you need at least two detectors. In practice, for reasons that were really good 10 years ago, but not so anymore, Hanford and Livingstone are sort of uh, parallel to each other. Um, uh, not, not, not quite, they still have an angle between them, but it means that they're not two completely independent detectors when it comes to polarization constraints which is a slight problem for us, but we, we can work with it. They're not completely parallel to each other. Okay, so if you have like a compact binary, then the gravitational waves have those two polarization states. The polarizations you get basically depend on the inclination, the, the, the angle with which you observe the, the binary in the sky. So if you have, and this, this, this is probably stuff that uh, the, the ones, the people in the audience who do electromagnetic follow-up for gravitational waves really, really know very well, is if, you if you're observing a binary face on, which means if you look up in the sky and the binary looks like a circle, then you are getting equal parts of both polarization states and that's the strongest emission. If you observe it edge on, you only get one of the two polarization states. That's when if you look up, the binary looks like a line. This is why you have a fairly strong selection effect towards face on systems. Um, so this is what happens in GR. Beyond GR, you also have extra polarizations because why not? GR is actually special in this aspect where only two degrees of freedom are excited. Generically, at least uh, for, for um, in, in vacuum, you can have up to, and, and in vacuum for, uh, for speed of light propagation signals, you can have up to six polarization states, uh, again, defined through how a ring of particles uh, uh, responds when the polarizations hit a ring of particles. And again, what happens is what's basically on the right when you're trying to measure. Each of these polarizations, the, 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 your detector will respond differently to each of these polarizations. So when you're trying to measure gravitational wave polarizations, again, it's the same story as trying to measure the sky location. Because let's imagine that you have a signal coming from in between the arms. So if you have your arms, it's coming 45 degrees from in between the arms. If you look at plus and cross, the response is zero, right? Completely zero. But if you actually see a signal coming from this direction, the only way for this to happen is if the signal actually has a vector polarization. And that is not GR. If you see something like that, that's a problem. So we can actually use this and go and analyze uh, uh, data. And here's an example of what you get. This is GW1905-21. Actually, I don't remember if I should say likely the heaviest or definitely the heaviest, but let's say likely the heaviest uh, binary black hole uh, with masses around uh, above, above about 50 solar masses. And this is a signal for which there was uh, a proposed kind of counterpart from ZTF. I'm sure a lot of you know a lot about this. Uh, but if you actually uh, uh, take this association between the gravitational wave signal and the counterpart, it means that you know the sky location of the source. And you can use that to analyze the data and put constraints on beyond GR polarization states. 
And the plot on the right shows you the signal to noise ratio, which means the strength in the signal in scalar and vector. So these are states, polarization states that should not exist if general relativity is, is correct. And assuming this uh, association and assuming um, that actually this is the correct sky location for the source, we don't find any additional polarization uh, states. So both scalar and vector are consistent with zero and you can place upper limits. Take this with as much uh, salt as you want because it does assume an association between the counterpart and the signal. Okay, so this is basically what I wanted to say. I want to uh, show you again a little bit about what the next plans are for gravitational waves. Every time I give a talk, I drag this shaded region a little bit to the right as time goes on. But now we're in the mid of 2021. We've had three observing runs, a fourth observing run will uh, start sometime in mid 20, uh, no earlier than mid 2022. Actually, this plot is a little bit out of date. So don't, don't look at the gray, the gray shaded regions. That's not where L4 is starting. Uh, in this similar time scale, uh, completely unrelated to ground-based detectors and everything I've discussed, but in a similar time scale, pulsar timing arrays uh, should make the first detection of gravitational waves in Anahar's regime. They're gearing towards this and it's very exciting. And we had a colloquium uh, a few weeks ago about this. Going even further ahead, there are plans for upgrades uh, to ground-based detectors, uh, getting them all the way. People have uh, imagined detectors that will get you all the way to basically observing almost every black hole in the interstellar binary in the universe, which is overwhelming is the word I will use. Uh, but in the same time scale, if you're talking about the 2030s, there's also LISA, the space-based detectors coming up in the Nilus Hearst regime, opening up completely new um, treasure trove sources. And I will finish here. I'll show this plot again, plot again. Thank you everyone. And looking forward to meeting you all after nine months of working in the same university. Thank you. Sorry? Uh, I need to unmute. Uh, let's see. So. Okay, okay. So let's thank Katrina uh, for a beautiful colloquium. And uh, let, it's time for questions. So please raise your hands. Uh, we have a record attendance. Um, it peaked at like 70 people on Zoom and 50 on YouTube. So we have 120 people. Uh, but please raise your Zoom hand and we'll just go in that order. So Venbin, please go ahead and ask your question. Um, yeah, so uh, I wonder how uh, how soon can we can we use the kind of a neutron star neutron star merger population to constrain the maximum mass of neutron stars using using LIGO? Do you have any like uh, like imagination like how soon how much of a population like ten or hundred? Given that we know two, uh, how, do will we ever get there? Yeah, I had. Okay, I unmute myself. I have a lot of thoughts about that. I'm glad you asked, including some slides I didn't show. So the big question here is whether you believe that neutron stars and black holes overlap. So if you don't think that neutron stars and black holes overlap, black holes stop at three solar uh, X solar masses above two, neutron stars stop at two solar masses, then you can measure the mass distribution of whatever light sources you have. And here's, here's an example again with simulated data. And that is with 50 events. So with 50 events, this is where you can basically start thinking about, about doing this, either the, the maximum or the minimum. But again, it depends a little bit on what the actual distribution is. If you get a lot of sources at two solar mass and then they cut off at two solar mass, then you, you're gonna measure the cutoff really well. But if you don't get a lot of sources at two solar masses and you kind of tail off, you know, you get a lot of sources at 1.8 solar masses and then they tail off at two solar masses, it will be much harder to measure the sharp cutoff. If there is a cutoff, we're going to measure it. How are you going to interpret this, though? Whether any of these could be black holes? Do you have any contamination from other, other types of objects? Well, 
on the black holes count. We, we don't see white doors. But if you get any uh, contamination from low mass black holes, things like that are gonna come into the discussion. But if there's a cutoff, we can measure it. And we can measure it maybe not with 04, uh, but close to 05, I would say we can measure it. Thanks so much. With detectors in the future that are sensitive to most of the observable universe, what would the event rate of neutron star mergers be that, that they would detect? Yeah, so, so uh, this kind of detector, if you're looking at the detectors that basically see the entire universe, then you're basically looking at how many neutron star uh, binaries there are in the universe. And given the current constraints of what we have observed, and uh, upper limits from the stochastic background, the number is about uh, one neutron star merger every 15 minutes. Sorry, 15 seconds. Uh, that doesn't mean we're gonna see all of those. Uh, but even, even pessimistically say you see half of those, it's, it's still overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gina, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, I was wondering, is there a, an intuitive way of explaining the polarizations of uh, GR? Why there are only two and why there are these? Yeah. Let's go back. Okay. So the, the polarizations are called from top to bottom tensor, ve tensor scalar and vector. They are not plotted in, 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 in order. So the reason GR excites, at least the re one of the reasons that you, you have the, 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 vector, the tensor polarization is that basically this is related to, to the helicity of, of something like, a, like a, a particle. So if you have in gravitational, if you, in GR, if you decide to think of, if you want to think of it in terms of a graviton, has a spin two, so you actually have tensor polarization. Um, another thing to think about is through rotations. So if you, if you think of rotations of, of the ring of particles and how the response goes, you will see that uh, the, the vector, sorry, the vector one at the, at the top, at the bottom, actually is invariant under rotations of pi over two, 90 degrees. The scalar doesn't care about rotations, the scalar. The tensor cares about rotations of pi over four. It's invariant under rotations of pi over four. So this is why you have tensor polarizations. It, it, has, it has to do with a spin two. If you, if you want to think about the graph, it has to do with a spin two. If you want to think of rotations, it has to do with a pi over four uh, rotation. The reason why now the bottom four are not excited in GR is a consequence of the GR field equations. Uh, so if you think of the, the GR, the Einstein equations, uh, you have the Einstein tensor is equal to zero. And if you do some calculations, you end up with the Ricci tensor is equal to zero. And this R mu nu is equal to zero, which is not generic for any theory of gravity, but it's true in GR, is what actually tells you that the blue and the green, the, the bottom four are uh, vanish. They, they're not excited in GR, at least in vacuum. And you only have the bottom two. The, so you only have the top two. Some other theory that actually does not satisfy that the Ricci tensor is zero will excite the bottom four. Uh, will excite some combination of the bottom four as well. Any other questions? Wenbin, did you raise your hand for another question? Yeah, uh, related to the polarization, I wonder if people have, uh, 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 because for GW70 or 17 we know the viewing angle reasonably well, much better than the black hole merger systems from the EM, from the EM follow ups. Did people actually make use of the kind of the viewing angle and then test the two, two polarization, a fraction of the two polarization, and then you know, existence of other polarization components? Yes. yes. I beat Manti to unmuting. <laughs> so yes, uh, this is actually exactly along the lines that we're, we're, we're thinking of. You, you, you have to think of which are your best cases for actually doing this measurement. And 17A17 is very good for this, as you, as you guess, because you also know the sky location. So this is the, the last line on this, uh, this slide. So um, the analysis that was done at the time of GW170817 was to compare whether you can have tensor or vector or scalar modes. Again, tensor means GR, vector or scalar means anything else. And just completely ruled out that you don't have tensor modes. 
this uh, this number 10 to the 21 sounds you know, huge. It is huge. It basically tells you that we're 10 to the 21 sure that tensor modes do exist. What we don't know from 17 or 17 is whether you can have your tensor modes from GR plus something else. So this is this is the additional a kind of analysis you can do. But GW 17 or 17 was the first time we we're actually able to say really for sure that tensor modes exist. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if, if not, then let's thank Katrina again, virtually or really, I can do it really. <laughs> and Judy's also clapping um, here. And, uh, and uh, let's uh, st uh, end the official colloquium and faculty are welcome to stay if they have additional questions. I just want to stay for the meet and greet. Thanks, everyone.